Listen to people's needs, pray with them, or invite them to meet you at church. St. Paul Street Evangelization can help you get started. Find out how at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. This is WFJS 1260 AM Trenton, WFJS 89.3 FM Freehold, WGYM 1580 AM Hamilton, and WSMJ 91.9 FM North Wildwood, Cape May. Communicating hope on Domestic Church Catholic Radio. Welcome back, friends. Another hour of Friday Live on this May 8th, the 125th anniversary of the birth of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And we certainly pray to him, don't we? Oh, yeah. He's been a friend of ours for many years now. Mm -hmm. But today, on this day, back in 1895. He was born. Born. Mm -hmm. 1895. Mm -hmm. 125 years. Somehow I thought he was more recent. Well, he died in 79. Right. Right, but that he so would have maybe been born in the, well, it's, it wasn't far from the early 1900s, but he just seems like such a contemporary. Mm. Certainly his words are could have been written today, huh? Oh, sure. Mm. Sure. Good friend of ours. Of course, now his body is in Peoria, so we're waiting for <laughs> the reopening of his of his cause, hopefully be beatified. You know, maybe they can follow in the long line of Italian tradition where they, uh, you know, the head yeah, is sure, buried head, in... Like St. <laughs> Catherine of Siena, right? <laughs> right. She's... Part of her, is her head in, in Siena and, yes. and her body in Rome? Yes. You saw her Or head. is it the other way around? Didn't you see her head? I didn't get a chance to see her head, but you saw her head, didn't you? I did. So that must have been Siena. Yeah. Yeah, they don't do that anymore, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only in horror half, films. Half, half and half. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Okay. So anyway, we're going to have our gospel reading, and this is the, already the fifth Sunday of Easter coming up, and our friend Father Chris Rogers uh, we'll do our reflection today. And then later on this hour, we're going to be joined by Michael Litchens to talk about the book, The Devil is Afraid of Me. It's um, uh, kind of a um, reflection or, or it just kind of highlights the life of Father Gabriel Amorth and his work as a world-famous exorcist. He has since passed away, but he had many, many exorcisms, thousands upon thousands. Which is fascinating. Yeah, so I mean, Michael... it's intriguing to many people. And it's almost a stretch, a connection to our earlier guest with Father Dwight, and uh, the immortal combat of good mm-hmm. against evil. This, these are things that we can't brush under the carpet because they're very, very real. Right. So anyway, we'll do this gospel, and then Father Chris will give the reflection. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not... Would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen. Amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ.
Greetings, everyone, and praise be Jesus Christ. I hope you find yourself well in these days, not just physically and spiritually, but emotionally and psychologically as well. I thank you for tuning in and listening, and God be with you today. This week, while the Sunday Gospel takes us to the last scene, uh, the last night of Jesus' life, his Last Supper, the second reading provides, if you will, a first supper. As we read from the first letter of St. Peter, this is a baptism homily, and it we hear from Peter himself addressing the newly baptized young people, women, men, children. And what a rich, what a beautiful meal, what a beautiful word Peter provides these new Christians. It's worth not only listening to at Mass or on live stream, but it's worth picking up your Bible this week and reading 1 Peter. It's a letter that begins with a beautiful invitation that we heard today. Come to me, a living stone, rejected and but chosen and precious in the sight of God. Peter's announcing Jesus as that living stone. But then he says this, let yourself be built up like living stones into a spiritual house to offer sacrifice acceptable to God. What beautiful news that these people who have heard this call of Jesus in their life, these people who, like us, in some way, shape, or form, have known rejection, being beaten up, or even persecution, that they are being called living stones. It's a beautiful word. It's a very important word. Peter goes on to say, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation who have been called out of darkness into wonderful light. My friends, how important it is that we hear that call. Every day now for the past six weeks, I've been saying Mass in a dark church. And I came across a, a uh, slogan recently, and it read, The church has left the building. And it has. The building is dark, but the church has left the building. We've been called out into the world to be a most wonderful light. My friends, as we begin this fifth week of Easter this week, as we continue to undergo the sacrifice of this difficult time, and as we celebrate Mother's Day, let us thank God that he has made us his people. And like children who are in the womb and who come forth into a most beautiful light, let us pray to not only receive that light, but to spread it this week. I encourage you to allow yourself, as Peter says, to be built up as living stones. Read the word of God this week. Be built up by it. And know that every sacrifice, every act of being with God, will yield a rich harvest. God be with you. Take you.
you by the hand and guide you to him gently. Keep your eyes on him. Walking down that road can be hard to do. Trusting in his love is how you get through. And your heart may be telling you to change direction, but you can't, because you've already Carly Simon. I <laughs> know. <laughs> a wannabe. Simonetta. Simonetta. Who you hear with during the rosary every morning with Father Groeschel. But she does That's sound right. like, I bet, I, I would bet that Carly Simon was an influence of hers. Sure. Her, Carol King, right. right? It's just the same style and everything. Sure. You can tell. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, you got a little message here on our, uh, on our um, uh, what do you call it, text Cheryl just wanted to say thanks for the book on praying the rosary. What an excellent choice. Oh, good. Arlene You're welcome. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to, we have shelves and shelves of books from all these publishers. We would never read them in a lifetime. So we might in- interview the author or something, and then we like to use those to give away as prizes. And I try to think, what would this person like, you know, because I, I don't know who they are and what they like. Mm-hmm. But. So sometimes, you made sometimes, the right choice there. With yeah, Arlene sometimes and Pete. it just clicks. Good, <clears throat> fabulous, very good. Uh, you made a mask that you wear. I you did made a music make mask. a mask. I should bring Where, it. Did you get a Did you get a pattern? No, it, it's very easy. It, I mean, it's just a nine by six piece of cloth. But you can go online anywhere. Um, AC Moore, Michaels. And then other people were just passing around. This is how you make them, and you know a lot of people are making the masks. So um, it's my it's mask really... wasn't good enough for you. The mask I made. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it was oh, friends. Let me just tell you what it was. All right, first of all, let me say it was pocket square. You know what pocket squares are? It's a pocket square for like the suit or the tuxedo, so it matches. Everything. Well, when I was doing my Sinatra gig a couple of years ago, you ordered... I ordered. But you had to buy a whole bag of them. Yes, it was like twenty four so, different colors, all kinds of different. So I yeah, obviously I had the red one or the what the white one, whatever I used when I sang. But there were other colors. Hot pink. So you you flip it over, so it likes like the Jesse James thing. A big triangle, right? And you put it up. But 
what I did was I took paper clips and kind of made like little like the end of ear, uh, eyeglasses mm-hmm. and and poked it through and twisted it around and they hang on your ears. <laughs> You could probably sell them on the street corner if there were people out on the street, yeah, but there's for, not. No. No, but I did. But I had what I had at home was fabric. It's black fabric with mus- multicolored music notes on it. So I thought, I have to have a music mask. But anyway. You know who's making the most money in all this? Let me guess, wait, pharmaceuticals? No, the people who make those plastic containers when you order in food. <laughs> Oh, all those yes, containers. That's right. That's because right. they're they're not. You could use them for. I mean, you could use them. You could, you could reuse, reuse them. them. Oh, sure. And they're, they're uh, fine. You know, you order. You order. You know, we order. We try to to uh, you know go support our local local restaurants. We'll order maybe mm-hmm. some type of order dinner or something in or, or breakfast. Sometimes we order right. breakfast. And they come in these beautiful, they come, yeah. t- practically Tupperware. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and sturdy and rewashable. I mean, but that's right. They can't be cheap. All these restaurants, cafes, and otherwise have to be ordering them by the thousands. Yeah, I mean, you know, you think about it. Mm. That there's so there's a business and other, but you mentioned pharmaceuticals. That's a whole different story. Right now, I was surprised somebody already has a book out. I did that come in today's. Yes, mail? Teresa Tamio. How did she write that already, like coronavirus and... Uh, I don't know. The publisher did... said, would you like to have Teresa Tamio on about this? And I said, you know, we're really trying to avoid <laughs> harping on that because just give people a respite from all that, you know? I know. I mean, God bless Teresa Tamio. She's lovely, but... But I'm just thinking of the logistics. How do you make that work? How do you write a book overnight and get it out in print and out to... I, this is... It, I don't, I don't know. You know, she didn't have a lot of lead time. You know? I don't know. It's not like you work on it for months. A lot, and... we, we, we've been getting a lot of songs, people who are writing songs so, that's right. about the coronavirus. Right. How about the, um, we were listening the other night to one of those news programs and the Beach Boys, you know, they're up that's in age. Right. That's and right. it was their style. I mean, you could have been on the beach. Was it Mike fun. Love? Is that the Beach Boy that was 79 years old and he was Michael singing about Love. Michael right. Love? And he... So look it up if you were into the Beach Boys. It was something about. Stay at home or. Well, they're just surviving Lock me up. This. <laughs> Lock Stay me away up. from me. <laughs> Lock me up. <laughs> Don't sneeze on me. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, I have a cough. <laughs> it's not funny. I'm going to no, apologize just, to all the friends out there. Do you see what I have to deal I with? Can't help it. I know you're praying for me right now. I am, but you know, it just it gets to it gets to a point, you know. I know. But think we could probably come up with some good song titles. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that later on your Zoom happy hour. Well, you know, hour I showed you. I know you know. I noticed that our you have a, a new welcome mat in our home. Was that a new welcome yes. mat? I saw. Yes, I've been to Lowe's and Home doing... Sweet Home or something. It says mm-hmm. Welcome. You home. can order one that says Go Away. <laughs> <laughs> and you literally do Google it. You can order a, oh, a place a, a welcome mat. No, it wouldn't be a welcome mat, but no. a doormat Un-welcome for your mat. home that says Go Away. You stay. I away. love it. I think that'd be great. <laughs> go away. Yeah, that would be good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So nothing's different for Jim. Nothing at all. Nothing, life has not changed. No, I got a call all. from one of our board members today saying how things going, and I said, you know, for me, it's no different. It's 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 li- it's business as usual because I I come it's here. It's a very and I do solitary my... type of job. You know, you do all your tasks here. You're on the air. It's just you, except when, you know, and when Jesus I come is in. next door in the, in the sure. chapel. Which he, okay. he and I are over there together a lot. Guest might come or go. So today, or... Bill and George were here, but we did socially mm-hmm. distance ourselves from each other. Yeah. So for you, it's work is the same. Yeah. But I have to tell you, I am so blessed and so thankful to be back, even at you know the, a minimal um, portion of what I do, it, to be back at church and playing. So yeah. it's it's just fine. Well, you always miss the organ. I mean, we try. Yeah. Didn't we try that a few years ago? You're going to give all that up, and you're going to come. Work, work at the, the radio station, and then two yeah. weeks later, you had you were you were subbing for somebody in the organ at the church. I couldn't stay away from stay the away keyboard. From no, couldn't. So I'm not ready yet to give that up. No, you shouldn't. That, that's your gift. Mm-hmm. That's your gift. That's, I do you love should it. be doing that. You shouldn't I didn't be realize how much I missed it. Spending your I was... time stuffing envelopes. Yeah. You know? You're using <laughs> so, your gift. So it's beautiful to be back. Yeah, and hopefully, I don't. Again, I, I don't know what the timeline is. Although I did read today. That public masses in Italy are beginning on May 18th. Right. So the thing is, we're in this hot spot. We're in New York, New Jersey, whatever this little central location. But we're watching everyone else as they unfold and they try to resume their life. And we will learn, you know, what works, what doesn't work. How fast can you do it? But I know. 
And we go, we are too. We're doing that too. We're reverting back to this topic of conversation. I know, but it's it, yeah. it's more so let us out. I, I just think people are just saying, okay, let us out. You know, yeah. enough. Uh, you know, you you want to be careful. You want to follow the guidelines, but people have to get back out to work and into living normal lives. We right. can't. You you know, like think about it. What would what would the ideal be? You know, what's what's when is the right time to to stop all this? Right. What uh, people will still they get it. People mm-hmm. will still die from it, no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. So. God forbid, but, you know, that happens. But the damage that's being done now to families who are truly, truly suffering. Yeah, like we, we want to hug our grandchildren. We had the FaceTiming with the other night, and we're, oh, my goodness. You just I know, wanna, I cried after that. You just want to hold them, and you can't. But my those people goodness. who are out of work, imagine like a mom-and-pop little cafe right. or breakfast spot or something, and that's all they have. And, all right, take out to a degree, but they're losing their entire livelihood. And perhaps their life's investment was in that That's restaurant. Right. That's right. And now they're literally can't buy food. Right. Or or the people that are alone, I think of the elderly, maybe they don't drive. Right. Um and normally would get visitors to you know keep them company or something. Mm. You're talking about solitary confinement. It's not good for your mental health. No, but then the numbers too are being skewed because I showed you that memo it was from the state senate in, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania where the Secretary of Health um, gave a statistics, half, half of the deaths in Pennsylvania, I don't know what the number is, but half of them were in, actually in nursing homes. Mm-hmm. Which, so yeah. when you see the numbers, oh, my goodness, all these people are passing away. Yes, anybody passing away is a tragedy, but a person in a nursing home obviously is in the last stages of his or her life. You and there are other conditions mm-hmm. and other... You know, other, uh, other, uh, ex- you know, just, yeah, let's not talk about it anymore. Yeah, like you would eventually, you know, <laughs> anyway. That's that. Something else. Had something on the that. bright side. Had enough of what that. are you doing now? So people are listening. Maybe you want to text. Give the number again. What are you doing Sunday in a different oh, way? Oh, Mother's Day. For Mother's Day. 609 493 8255. You can text us right here. I'll get it right on my little laptop or Chromebook here that I have in front of me, 609-493-8255. You can text. What are your plans in this very unusual Mother's Day? Right. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of Zooming going on. Or people gonna, that family or Zoom. People, you know, maybe right. people who say, you know what? My kids are well. I'm well. We've Let's been visit. well for two months. Let's go visit. Let's go visit. Right. We can't say that. But, and we are well, but it's, right. it's not our call. Well, well our daughter-in-law is pregnant, so. You have to be extra Be very careful. careful. Yeah. Number three is on the way. So we're excited about that. Yeah. And actually, we did find out the due date. This is the Feast of St. Faustina, Faustina, October Maybe they'll 5th. name her Faustina. Yeah. <laughs> or Quarantina. <laughs> <laughs> Quarantina. <laughs> okay. Or we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. No, we don't. No. I hope it's a surprise this time. I don't think he's... I think they're still playing. I asked him. I asked Joseph. I asked our son. He said, no, they're going to find out. Oh. I always like the surprise of it. Right. But anyway, so uh, so what did we do? Careful. Did we paint the room a neutral color? Then we yeah, it was white. Well, that's it was white. about as neutral as you can get. <laughs> it was white. Don't you yeah. remember white? We put up um, little, you know, little neutral. Just all what those do you call that? Uh, pastel, yeah. Yeah, blue, yellow, pink, green. Actually, I'll tell you, it was this day. You talk about my fine memory. May eighth, nineteen eighty eight, when you found out you were pregnant with Joseph. It was Mother's Day. It was Mother's Day. It was Mother's Day. Oh, that was fun. That was a Mother's Day. That was fun. We had we, I tell the story because it's a lovely story. We were we had had two previous miscarriages, and we, you didn't know you were pregnant yet. And we went out to dinner for Mother's Day, which was like a, you know, it was, it was like a, just to go. I know, but it was Mother's Day, and mm-hmm. you know, we had already had the two miscarriages. Like, and and yeah, there was a woman. I, there what was this thinking? woman walking. I don't remember the restaurant we went to. It was in Phoenix. We were living out there at the time. And she came around. She had a bunch of roses in her arm. And she was going around from table to table giving out roses to the mothers. Mm-hmm. And she came to our table, which was you and me, and she said, are you a mother? And you said, no. And she, she gave you a rose. She goes, oh, you will be. And then she, like, vanished. And she went yeah. away. I never <laughs> saw her again. Just went away. And that day we were driving home, and you said, stop at the drugstore. I have to get something. Yeah. In those days it was the little kit, right? Yeah, the kit. <laughs> And I guess you took they still the test, have them. and it was Mother's Day, and you found out you were pregnant with Joseph, our first, our first uh, baby. That's right. But she knew whoever that woman was oh, passing out roses. <laughs> Fabulous fun. 
sometimes life is full of surprises. You never know. You never know. And uh, that was a, that was a that was a, an interesting day because I, I think about that often. Like who, I, I, I you know for her to be walking around just with a bunch of roses, passing out roses mm-hmm. in this restaurant was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the memory. But it was May eighth, so that's what made me think of that. May eighth was Mother's Day, and I believe in nineteen eighty eight. Mm hmm. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Long time ago. It was. It mm-hmm. was a handful of years. Now our baby is having babies. Yeah. He's, many babies later. Here we are. He seems to be uh, doing well as a dad. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful to see them. Yeah. Growing up. And I think the last, well, no, we saw them, we vacationed with them in the winter. We were out in Phoenix for a couple of weeks, but then. Um, we went to EWTN in the, the yeah, beginning of Yeah, but we only March. saw them once in between. Well, since then, we saw we were in Phoenix, but, but but then we only saw them once after that. And that's I thought it was it. the Monday after EWTN, maybe. No, before EWTN. Ooh, so it was probably around in between March, Phoenix March and 2nd. EWTN. Yeah. yeah, probably March second or third. That's Ooh. the last we've seen of them. That's still over two months. And you know what? We were spoiled because we see them probably once a week. So and we spent had just spent you know two weeks, a couple weeks with them, with them out <laughs> mm. <laughs> every day. I hope they're listening. We're waiting. Yeah. We're ready. No, we're ready. But we got to be careful because Tori is you know, supposed to be careful. But as soon as we get the go-ahead, they're coming to our house for a week. There was a great <laughs> video on I saw online where it says, when the lockdown is over, visiting grandma, and this car pulls up, and two kids <laughs> they get thrown out of the car, and a couple of suitcases in the car <laughs> <laughs> speeds away. <laughs> That'll be them. <laughs> because being in and trying to keep them entertained, I mean, they're young, so they need a lot of attention. You know, if they're if they're mid um, elementary school, they can play board games, they do their thing. But with the their one and three, you're playing with them and right. keeping them busy. So right. that's demanding. And she's tired, and she's pregnant, and Joseph's working. So. Uh, every family situation is different. But, you know, I, I have to go back to our first guest. I keep thinking about this Father Dwight Longenecker, mm-hmm. that the story of him being married with children. That is, like, so intriguing to me. Like, I want to look that up and, and read how that can be. I know well, the church allowed it. I know it, but I just want to read more about it. Yeah. All right. See, we, there's something to learn every day. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a break. We're going to uh, come back, and we're going to be joined by Michael Litchens, and um, he's going to talk about the book, The Devil is Afraid of Me. So stay where you are, my friends. There's more to come on Friday Live.
All right, sing it, Mary. Well, we're having a little um, difficulty reaching Michael Litchens. Hope the devil didn't get him. <laughs> <laughs> the devil was afraid of him, but uh, uh, I don't they know. could be in battle right uh, now. I left our phone number. Maybe he'll give us a call back. Right, this well. is when you do live interviews. You know, it's always like okay. That's the risk. That's Although, you know, it's funny to watch on television now because they're all forced to do either Zoom or um, uh, FaceTime or, you know, in Skype. Terms of, yeah, uh, as far as, like, you, you know. Even the yeah. weather. It's their home. They're in their garage. And you see the breaking, the you know, the picture breaks up and the, and the, right. the, the sound gets a little, a little Sound distorted. delay sometimes, yeah. Uh, so they're no different than we are, I guess. But anyway. <laughs> where was the one where the, the gentleman was working from home and he was on a conference call and or on his Zoom, and in the background comes the little toddler in one of those walkers oh, coming it's, towards... Oh, he's British, I think, a British uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then caster. the mother comes in to get the baby, and the other one runs in. All right, I think we might have a, a okay, caller let's here, so it. let's see what we do. Hi, is this Michael? It is, Michael. Ah. <laughs> Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. We were a little concerned with that. Maybe, you know, we were having a little battle with the devil. <laughs> uh, you know, technology problems tend to follow me, and I've wondered sometimes. So, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, we want to welcome to the program Michael Litchens. And uh, Michael is the editor of Catholic Exchange. And when he's not uh, revising and editing, he's often found studying and writing about G.K. Chesterton, religion and literature, or random points of local history. He holds an A.M. from the University of Chicago Divinity School and B.A. from St. Thomas More College of Liberal Arts. And we're going to talk about today uh, a book called The Devil is Afraid of Me. Now, Michael, this is a book, of course, we know of the late Father Gabriel Amorth, who was a world-famous exorcist. Tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about this particular book, The Devil is Afraid of Me, and how it relates to Father Gabriel. Well, Father Gabriel, uh, we have that subtitle in there, The World's Most Popular Exorcist. I'm not sure if Father Amorth would have uh, accepted that or not, due to his particular sense of humor and opinion about himself. But uh, this book is a collection of stories from people who worked with Father Amorth, as well as Father Amorth's words from previously unpublished interviews. And it gives us a background into an exorcist who really did work diligently. Even in his old age, he would see up to 17 people a day who would need various prayers of liberation or exorcisms. And he did that really until he died in 2016, and thus his funeral was well attended by thousands of people in Rome. Mm. You know, the first question that comes to me, Michael, and and I'm not sure that you could answer this. Now, of of course, we have this Father Gabriel. We know of some other priests Mm -hmm. that are— Is there a certain charism? I mean, not every priest um, will— be labeled as an exorcist. Am I correct with that? Like, are, are there only certain priests mm-hmm. that maybe get either additional training or something? Yes, yeah, Father Amortha notes, and this is true across the world, bishops have the full right to decide who is an exorcist and when an exorcism is needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we as all Christians, we can absolutely pray with confidence and have trust in the Holy Spirit to guide us. But with uh, Father Gabriel, he noted that not every priest could do it, and some priests were better, not better, it's probably the wrong word, but some priests were more effective exorcists than others, even mm-hmm. if they were all sharing the same ministry. Right. And Father Morth said that was true of him, too. Sometimes people did better under other exorcists than him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I, imagine... you, I think... I was oh, gonna, go ahead. I was going to say, I imagine it, it is more like a, a charism, a certain calling, a certain yeah. gift, you know? It absolutely is, and in many ways it's rooted in a lot of the virtues we understood. Father Morth was a parish priest before he became an exorcist, as several exorcists are. I know a couple academics who found themselves becoming exorcists, but that's a little rare. Mm. And one of the th- hallmarks is obedience and trust, and those are the big things that if you can have... A- a- what Father Morth brings is he has absolute trust that the Holy Spirit is guiding him and protecting him. Mm. Well, now, the, the book is called The Devil is Afraid of Me. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, what can our readers gain from reading this book? What will they discover about either exorcism or the devil himself or, or the, just the presence of evil and the action of the evil one? Tell us a little bit about the content and, and what people will get from it. Well, I think what they'll get from it is they'll learn a lot from the personal experience and stories from Father Amorth about the spiritual world, which, as Father Amorth notes, and any of us who go to church know this, spiritual warfare is not talked about from the pulpit as often as it should be. It's just not addressed whatsoever in many churches. Some people go their entire lives not hear one sermon or homily about how 
we here on Earth are engaged in a battle for the soul of ourselves and for others. Right. And that's, I think, the most important lesson. But you'll also learn really practical advice, such as prayers of liberation that can help you if you're feeling like there might be something off in your home or things of that nature, or if you are unlucky enough to anger an occultist and they start putting curses on you. These are things you can learn. And a lot of them reinforce just what you were taught as a child growing up, but it puts it into a greater context when you learn about spirits that wish to do you harm. Mm. And now we know exorcism, or rather I should say possession, is an extreme. The action yes. of the enemy, the evil one, is very active, though, and there is, you know, there, there, obviously there's temptation. But can you talk a little bit about, or does Father Amor talk about just the various levels, I guess, of, of dealing with demons, with evil, with, with uh, the devil mm-hmm. himself? Yeah, and there's a couple. Possession, of course, is the most extreme, but... As Father Amorth notes, you don't have to be possessed to be vexed by a devil. Vexation can happen. It's happened to saints. Padre Pio and uh, St. John Vianney are two well-known saints who were being physically clawed or attacked or thrown off their bed by a devil, but they were never possessed. They never gave permission or any kind of opening door for the demon to enter them, but still God allowed them to be vexed by these devils. Uh, There can also be physical disturbances. These can be particular pains or things that can move around your house that shouldn't be moving. We all know uh, that's about as Hollywood as it can get, really. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's infestation, which Father Morth only uses for when demons are attaching themselves to particular objects like houses, books, paintings, things like that. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, uh, possession isn't as common as some would think. No, no. And goodness knows I'm not possessed, but there have been times I've kicked Jim out of bed. I'm just, just going <laughs> to generally share that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I thought about true. throwing holy water at my cat, but that's just going to be loud. <laughs> oh. oh, there you go. I hear I know. But see, that's a, that's a good point, though, because we have these weapons, don't we, against mm-hmm. evil like as lay say, people. Holy water, right, prayers. Sacramentals. Yes, a uh, holy salt of Father right. Amor's uh, Father Amor's teacher for the exorcism, a very interesting fellow named Father Candido that I'd love to see a book about him someday written, uh, would often place holy salt whenever people would report, I think my house is haunted, or I think there's something in the basement. He would come in and place holy salt all around, Mm -hmm. and then have people pray a rosary. In fact, Father Amor says that there's never a bad time to say a rosary or just to say a quick prayer of thanks to God. Mm -hmm. And those are very powerful weapons in and of themselves, but of course we also have confession, the sacraments, and if it needs to come to it. You have spiritual warriors who can do the exorcisms. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Michael Litchens about the book, The Devil is Afraid of Me, uh, Father Gabriel Amorth, and it's published by Sophia Institute Press. That's sophiainstitute.com is their website. Uh, Michael, and we just, in some of the experiences that Father Amorth discusses in there, he had some pretty, even violent uh, um, experiences with, with with the devil when he was performing exorcisms, didn't he? He certainly did. Uh, he mentions one thing that I thought was fascinating to learn, which is many exorcists get very good at handling a handkerchief to prevent people from spitting on them. Hmm. But he's been kicked, he's been bitten, he got head-butted. People will try to, like, break ribs and things like that, so physical danger would happen. For me, the most chilling story was his very first exorcism, where as the exorcism began, the temperature changed and ice crystals were forming on the windows, mm. even though it was a warm day, and it even felt dark, felt and looked a little darker than when he started. Mm. And sure enough, as he's doing the exorcism, he gets to the point where he can say to the demon, Great Chief OTB, I command you, what is your name? And the demon responds, Lucifer. And that's when Father Morth realized his first exorcism is battle to battle with Lucifer. Wow. 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 And I I understand, too, that exorcists will ask the demons their name. Yes. Is there a reason Uh, for that, a particular reason for that? Is it... it... Yes. uh, Actually, Father Morth gets into that a little bit in this book. What they're trying to establish is that the name of the demon can, sometimes like angels, the name can reveal a lot about the nature of the entity. And so when it is revealing its name, it might even say its name is a particular temptation, and that could be an idea of where this demon entered in and how it came to be. 
in this person's life. And that can really help with the healing to address the root cause of what is going on. And really what exorcism and all the sacraments are aiming for is to give us the spiritual healing we need. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You mentioned, uh, Michael, how the demon entered yeah. in. And, and so does he address anywhere that that crack in the door, that window? Because many times we're trying to discern uh, a decision or, you know, we're tempted to do something and we can easily justify that it's going to be good for us. So we're, we're almost sure. in a battle with ourselves. How do I discern God's <laughs> voice versus the voice of Satan? So would that be a, a moment where a demon could, could enter in? Absolutely. Father Morth actually talks about, especially when people are in times of trial or are very confused, as many of us are feeling right now, Sure, it's not uncommon because it's out there to go seeking out uh, more esoteric ideas, you know, get someone to read your tarot cards, to tell you your fortune, to communicate with the dead on your behalf, to find hidden knowledge. And that can be right there with the door opening, especially if it's feels effective the first time, then you're going to keep going back. Right. And pretty soon, uh, what Father Morth calls obsession begins, where your brain will not stop thinking about these things, Mm -hmm. which is another form of vexation, unfortunately. Does the individual have to give permission to allow a possession? Possessions are typically done uh, through... How do I explain this? There are... There's multiple cases of how someone can be possessed, and one of them is, you know, you're doing a satanic covenant, you made a deal with a dark angel, or that maybe you thought it was a god, but you made a deal with it, and now it's fulfilling the deal, slowly taking over you. Mm. But there are cases, Father Morth ran into, where people became possessed because, through some horrible circumstances, they also, on top of everything else, got cursed, and felt themselves slowly giving themselves into the creature that was now fulfilling the curse. And Father Morth had noticed that, especially in cases where a mother-in-law is angry at a marriage and will go, I'm laughing about this just because of the absurdity and why would you do this, but they would go and find a fortune teller or a professional witch and say, you know, curse my future son-in-law, I don't want them to stay together, and Mm -hmm. that can lead to at minimum vexation, but in cases, Father of Morth noticed it did lead to possession. Mm. Wow. It sounds like you're watching a lot of movies during the quarantine. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, <I'm> just... <laughs> my gosh, I know. <laughs> of course, we say now possession is, is the extreme. The more, the more common are these instances of, of you know, little little more nuances. They, they, they're, mm-hmm. And, of course, we know the devil and demons are no are, certainly are not stronger than God himself, and God only allows. No. God, They can only do what God allows. Is that what Father of Morth would say? Yes, he uses Job to illustrate this, that God will, everything that happens, and this is a very Augustinian approach, but everything that happens in this world, within the cosmos, is only done because God allows it to happen. And that can include evil. He's not the cause of evil. He's not the author. He doesn't make it happen to you. But if through especially circumstances in your life, he can permit those things to occur. And in the case of the saints, as I mentioned earlier, he even would allow the devil to tempt them to prove their holiness. Which is a big, it's one of the weirdest things. It's like, you're God's favorite. Guess what that gets you? <laughs> uh, the demonic fixation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do hear about the great saints, like you mentioned Padre Pio, yeah. who actually had these, I mean, these battles with, 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 mm-hmm. uh, with the, the devil. And, and when we say the devil, you mentioned Father Amorth, his, his exorcism, when he dealt with Lucifer himself. But we're talking about the other third of the angels who were fallen. fallen they're, yeah. the, they're the other ones we're battling with as well. Yes. Yeah. So and yeah, uh, oh, go ahead. Can they hide from an exorcist? Can the demons hide? The, 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 is is this is an exorcist? Cheryl mentioned charism, but this the gifts that a, an yeah. exorcist may have. Can he? Does he know? Can the, uh, the uh, can demons you know hide behind a chair and he not know they're there? <laughs> you see, some priests are actually blessed with very great discernment. Uh, Father Moore seems to have had some of it, but most of the time he says his gift of discernment was nothing compared to say Padre or his mentor, Father Candido, that they could just look at someone and really get a sense of not only what was vexing their soul, but what caused that to happen and thus could get them healing. Fascinating. I know we know that with Padre Pio, that he could be in the confessional and really talk to people and tell them things about their lives they told no one. Right. Uh, 
was the more he would have to do a little diagnosis, and he found, yes, the demons did not only hide from him, this will surprise no one, but demons like to lie, <laughs> and they would often lie to him. They would try to trick him, oh, you know, we've left already, <laughs> and he, the person would have to come back, and he'd do an exorcism, and that was a learning experience for him. Wow. Wow. Well, it's a fascinating topic and something, as you mentioned, you know, yeah. we don't hear a lot about it. I know Pope Francis talks a lot about the devil and the presence yeah, of the devil. Right. He's not hold, held back on that. But but for a good time, it wasn't really verbalized, you know, to the point where yeah. sub, so there's a generation that just doesn't believe that the devil is real, you know, because we've not mm-hmm. been instructed. Um, mm-hmm. It's just not been in the... That evil is an abstract. There's the, no there's yeah. no personification to it, but there is. Right, right. Mm-hmm. There absolutely is, and but the important thing to remember, as you both said, is uh, and Father Moore's direct line is the mercy of God is nothing against. I'm sorry, the devil is nothing against the mercy of God. Amen. And right. That's something we can always take to heart. Amen. Well, the book is called "The Devil Is Afraid of Me," uh, Father Gabriel Amorth. We've been talking with Michael Litchens, who uh, has joined us to talk about uh, from Sophia Institute, and the website is sophiainstitute.com. That's the website, friends. You can check it out. The devil is afraid of me, Father Gabriel Amorth. Uh, fascinating, uh, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, and we appreciate you being here today. Thank you both so much. God bless you. Have a great weekend. God, God bless, bless you. you. Stay well. All right, friends, and you stay where you are. We'll be right back in just a bit. Don't go away. I went to church and just sat there and listened. I really didn't absorb anything. I think I just found myself believing that I didn't need God. I just had everything under control, and church was actually a a burden to me. I had this sin that I carried in my heart for a long time, and I told myself for many, many years that the Lord wouldn't forgive me for this. When, when Father in the confessional says, your sins are forgiven, there truly is a, a feeling of, of weight lifted off. I don't care if it's two or three little sins that you're carrying, there's a feeling of I can breathe deeply again. I feel pure inside and I'm, and I'm ready to come to Mass. You can have a beautiful car, a big fancy home. If you don't have Christ in your life, there's an emptiness that's there. When you come home to the, to the church, You're coming home to a Catholic family where people today just embrace you. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. All right, welcome back, friends. And just a couple minutes left before we have to head on out of here. But uh, interesting topic. I know. Light beach reading. (laughs) (laughs) Take the book to the beach with you. Did you ever read The Exorcist? Yes. I mean, not the the movie, but actually read the book? I did read the book. I read the book the summer that I was working on Amtrak. Okay. I was driving, you know, that summer, I didn't know you then, but I was, it was between my, my, um, my, my freshman and sophomore year in college, and I got a gig on Amtrak. I would ride the Silver Star from New York to Miami and, and entertain on the club car, play the banjo and guitar <laughs> and sing. That was my summer job. That was before Catholic Radio. Before, yeah. But I, they Did gave you me, wind up sleeping with the light on? They I mean, gave that... me a little roomette, so I had my own little room, and, but I remember reading the book. Because I would sing for five, you know five five hours in the evening, but the rest of the day I was just I had nothing to do, so I would sit right. in my little and watch watch the countryside go by the train wow. window. I've never seen one of those little rooms on a train. The bed would pull out of the yeah. It was a room. It had a door and everything. You know, you had it was locked. You, your own little room, but that, but the bed would pull out of the wall. Okay. Like over a, the sink and the uh, the commode. A pull down cot. Yeah, sort of and thing. sleep there. Is and, there a weight uh, limit? I'm just excuse me. <laughs> No, I. I'm Why not, do you ask? <laughs> I'm just curious. I, I I don't know anything about how that works. Well, that's the way. Well, this is 1974. I don't know yeah. if it's you know this has changed since yeah, then. Just just thinking about but it. But I remember reading the book, The Exorcist, while I was on the train, and I would start to hear noises in the like oh. knockings and. Oh, and, sure. The train is so noisy. No, but it was it wasn't the train. It wasn't the train noises. Mm. It wasn't the train. Well, I did. I will tell you this. You know, when you would flush the commode. <laughs> You would you'd open up and you'd see the tracks going by. So it like would just. Oh my gosh! Isn't that pretty pretty? I wonder if it's just my my particular car. <laughs> just <laughs> I've never seen nobody else's. <laughs> no, you flushed, you flushed the, flushed Aren't the you thing glad you you're the... turning into Catholic radio? <laughs> you will get the good news right here, friends. That's it's... another little tidbit, probably people didn't know that I entertain on Amtrak for That's one right. summer. No, it's very good. And I was good. earning, and I was making it was good money too. 
I'm sure. I was making good money that summer. I made. I think I paid for you know everything I needed for college and beyond. And they fed you, right? Sure, yeah. sure. Everything was free. Well, it sounded like, and people probably know this story, but again, r- right before I met you, I was overseas for almost a year, mm. and it was the same thing. I was living in a hotel. They gave me my room. I got all my meals, and I would just play and sing every night for four or five hours. And the rest of the day was free. So I would go to museums. I would walk. I did make some friends and or go out to the pool. It was absolutely beautiful. And I made very good money. Yeah. We but, made decent money. We were entertaining. What not happened the, not, to all that Not money? the kind of money we're making here at Catholic Radio. Oh, right. <laughs> mind you. <laughs> right. But uh, that's all right. It's a nice little sacrifice. That's okay. But those were the days. But yeah, I remember reading The Exorcist on the train and getting frightened by it. Because I think the movie, with the, the book was a little more detailed As usual, than the, the movie. You know, yeah. the book is going to have a lot more detail than the movie. And then wasn't there Exorcist 2, which I have vague I don't even remember seeing the first movie. I don't think I ever even saw the movie. Yeah. But I remember I read The Exorcist and The Godfather. Those are the two, the two books I read on the train. That summer? Yeah. 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 And The Godfather, the book The Godfather is a lot more detailed, too, than the movie. And the movie's long enough. I mean, it's. I think it's still playing. <laughs> it is still playing. <laughs> 50 years. Any other texts? Any messages from anyone? Uh, what are you doing Sunday? Oh, yeah, we did get one. Day? I'm sorry, we did get one from, uh, uh, let's see, Mother's Day this year. Starts with a streamed Holy Mass, followed by several FaceTime chats with family, oh. and then grilled filet mignon. Ooh. If the weather is good, we'll walk the county park trail with the dogs. Get those people's address. Well, that P- sounds. It's Pete and Arlene. Oh, <laughs> We're going to meet them. They sent, didn't they send you a recipe for cheesecake? That's or something? right. That's right. And they're having filet mignon. And what are we doing? Oh, Mother's how Day? beautiful! I don't know. I'm sure you are planning a wonderful surprise. For well, me. you're not my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? I am the mother of your children. Well, then my children should be calling you and making arrangements. I know. You know, my mother, God rest her soul, is with the Lord. So, I, but I'm sure Pete is now. Is when they were little, for Arlene. wait a minute. Does this mean that I now I'm responsible for Mother's Day? <laughs> what you mean? You don't have anything planned? This con- this wait a conversation is going to continue. So this is after okay. The show. Does is the husband? There's a question for you. Is the yeah. husband responsible to buy Mother's Day gifts? I mean, when the children were little, a different story because they were right. little, they couldn't go out and buy gifts and stuff. I'm going to have to Google it. But they're it. grown adults with their own children now. Shouldn't they be doing all that? And I just kind of sit back and enjoy the day with you? <laughs> wow. Wow. What do you think? Okay, I'm going to need to hear from people on this one. <laughs> so what do you think? But am I, am I, not that I don't have anything for you. I no, could. I feel like, I feel like. The... When they were little, I did that because they yeah. were little. They couldn't go to the store. And buy. But now since then. No. Right. But I don't know. Like I would send. Well, now my mom's passed away, but, uh, you know, I yes. would send her flowers. That it would be the responsibility of the children, and they're not even listening, so I'm probably going to not have anything. I used to have to remind them, <laughs> but I don't them. anymore. You call them and tell them I'm going to be home waiting. All right, well, we'll do something. <laughs> you and I will do something. We can do something. Certainly we will. I know. I just, I just. <sighs> we'll go to Wawa and buy a chocolate bar. Oh, oh, I'm good okay. with that. Sounds good. I'm good with that. All right. Well, we're going to head on out of here. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. And um, we'll be back next Friday, God willing. Father Wade Menezes is going to join us next Friday. Oh. Yeah. He has a new book out, so we'll talk to Father Wade next Friday. Um, I'll be back on Tuesday. So have a great weekend. Thanks for being with us. God bless you. God bless you.